חבר'ה, וולקאם, שבוע טוב, חודש טוב, חודש. אנחנו נתחיל מדברת דף זיין עומד בייס, אנחנו נתחיל מדברת עוד פעם מהשקד משנה, כדי להיות יכול להיות... מה פעם זה 7B? 7B3. So it's the second Mishnah, Ein bein Shabbos liyem ha-Kippurim. There's no difference between Shabbos and Yem Kippurim. So the, what this means is that with regards to uh, Shabbos and Yem ha-Kippurim, really um, with regards to what you are allowed to do and you're not allowed to do, they're all the same. There's nothing you're allowed to do on Yem Kippur um, that you're not allowed to do on Shabbos or vice versa, you could say it as well. There's nothing you're allowed to do on Shabbos um, that you're not allowed to do on Yom Kippur. But here, the, I mean, I guess the main thing is to tell me that all the things that are prohibited on Shabbos are also prohibited on Yom Kippur. So whereas on Yom Tov, you're allowed to carry and you're allowed to cook. On Yom Kippur, you're not. You're not allowed to carry. You're not allowed to cook. So therefore, all the laws are the same. So then what's the difference between Shabbos and Yom Kippur? <laughs> Says the Mishnah, with regards to Shabbos, it's punishable by the Bezdin down here, by human beings. And somebody who deliberately desecrates Yom Kippur, so they are punishable with Karis, which is from heaven, that you die before your time because Hashem exacts it from you. However, it's not punishable by human beings. So that's what we're saying is the only difference between the two. Okay? Yeah? So far, so good? Yeah. Says the Gemara, if you're telling me that there's no difference between the two, between Shabbos and Yom Kippur, that means to say that means that only with regards to whether you're going to be punished by heaven or by the, by the Bezdin is a difference. But when it comes to the laws that are associated with monetary payments, which means to say that if a person violated the Shabbos and while violating the Shabbos, he caused damage to a friend. And now he has both uh, the consequence of being put to death because there were Adim and there was warning and they're going to bring him to Bezdin and Bezdin are going to put him to death. The fact that he's going to be put to death, we apply the rule of Kimlei, that a person will only have to um, bear the consequences of the more severe punishment and not the less severe punishment. And therefore, any monetary uh, obligations that he would have to the person for burning something that belonged to him, he would not be obligated to pay. So we're saying that that would be true, not only with regards to Shabbos, but also with regards to Yem HaKippurim. Why? Because... The Mishnah had said there's no difference between Shabbos and Yom Kippur, other than that when it comes to be uh, when it comes to the consequences, when it comes to the punishment, one is by heaven and one is by earth. But with regards to a person not being obligated to pay monetary uh, repayments when he was go when he is going to be uh, receiving a death penalty, right? It seems to be they would be the same. Ah, what about the fact? that this one, you're going to be killed by human beings, and this one is going to be killed by Hashem, by getting chorus, there's no difference. That's what it seems. So the Gemara says, yeah, Zev is Hashem, and both of them are the, uh, both of them are the same. The Gemara, Mani Masni said, who's the tanner, who's the author of our Mishnah? So we say, Rabbi Nechun Yibin Akona, oh, he, it's Rabbi Nechun Yibin Akona, the Tanya. For we learned in a brisa, Reb Nachun Yebel Akana, Hayo Isis Yem Kippur B'Shabbos L'Tashlumin. Reb Nachun Yebel Akana, he considered Yem Kippur to be like Shabbos in regards to monetary payment. What does that mean? Here he spells it out. Ma Shabbos, just like Shabbos, somebody who violates the Shabbos and simultaneously commits an act for which he has to repay somebody else. He incurs the death penalty, and he is exempt from the payment. So just like that is the case for Shabbos. So so to Yom Kippur, if he simultaneously violated 
um, a prohibition for which he's high of courage, he's going to be um, cut off early by Hashem, he's not going to be obligated to pay the money. He incurs the death penalty, Koris, is exempt from the payment. Okay. We learned elsewhere in a Mishnah. All those who are liable to Koris, who were flogged by the Bezdin, become exempt from their Koris. What does this mean? This means like this. Why is a person going to be obligated uh, or punished with kares? Because there's a warning in the Torah that tells us, do not do this. So anybody who does any work on Yom Kippur, right, he's going to be cut off, right? So there's a love. And when it comes to a love, right, you can have a warning. And when a person is warned by uh, two witnesses and brought to Bezdin, and he is um, proven to have violated something knowingly, then the best didn't have the power to flog him, to give him Malchus, right? Now, generally speaking, what we say is any negative uh, commandment that does not have a punishment stated explicitly by the Torah, then the punishment is flogging, Malchus, right? So if you do something, for example, it says a person should not wear shotness, right? So what happens if a person violates wearing shotness and he was warned and he still did it? So then he can be taken and he can be given malchus by the bezdin, right? And likewise, all the other laughing. However, there are lavin in the Torah, which are these negative pro, uh, commandments in the Torah, where the Torah tells us that the bezdin have to put him to death. So obviously... If a person is going to be uh, is going to violate this negative commandment, then he's going to be put to death. Obviously, he's not going to be flogged. He's going to be because the Torah prescribes already death as his penalty. However, what happens in a case where you have a prescribed punishment? The punishment is that he's going to be cut off from heaven. So it seems that according to the Tana of this Mishnah that we're quoting right now, anybody who's Chayv Kores, if they were taken and they were warned beforehand and they were taken to the Bezdin and the Bezdin flogged them and gave them Makis, then that cancels out this, the Kores and they won't be punished in heaven. They won't be punished by Shemayim and they won't be cut off. How? Where does this Tana learn it from? Shenema, like it says in the Pasuk, Venikla Achicha Leinecha, says your brother will be uh, demeaned before your eyes. So what's this about? We explained this last time. This means is, in the context, it's talking about why a person should not be flogged more than 40. And as the rabbis explain, it's not really 40, it's really 39. Why not? Because if you're going to flog him one more, then he's obligated to be flogged, then what you're going to be doing is you're going to be demeaning your brother in front of, in, in, before your eyes. And that is, a pro, that is not allowed. That's not allowed. But what that teaches me is that once he becomes flogged, he returns to being your brother. And in fact, in the Mesechus Makas, it talks about how if in certain circumstances, a person, if he, uh, if he, um, Due to the flogging, he urinates on himself or in some way embarrasses himself, that's enough, and one doesn't have to give him any more malchus because once he becomes embarrassed, that's enough to remove remove um, the, 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 the obligation. Not, not just the obligation, but the, the negative thing the that he impacts himself stain. with. The, thank you, the spiritual stain. He, he was able to remove the spiritual stain, and therefore he goes back to being your brother. But what do we see? Kivan says the Gemara, Kivan Shilaka, once he has been flogged, so now he's like your brother. And so therefore, we apply the same principle to Kares, that once he becomes flogged, he's no longer going to be Chayim Kares, because now he goes back to being Yachicha. Divrei, Rebbe Chananiah, Ben Gamliel, these are the words of Rebbe Chananiah, Ben Gamliel. 
Now, why did the Gemara bring this? The Gemara bring this, brings this for the following statement of Rabbi Yechanan. Rabbi Yechanan, Amar Rabbi Yechanan, Rabbi Yechanan says, Haluk in Olav, Haverov, Reb Hanania ben Gamliel, Al, Al Reb Hanania ben Gamliel, that Reb Hanania ben Gamliel's colleagues disagreed with him. Now, although in the Mishnah that we quoted, there's no mention of anybody disagreeing with Reb uh, with, with, with Hanania ben Gamliel, so Reb Yechanan, who's saying that the Chachamim disagree with Reb Hanania ben Gamliel, where does he know this from? We don't know. So Amar Rava, Rava says, Amri Bey Rav, they said in the school of Rav, that when you want to know where Rabbi Yechonah got it from, Tznina, it's from the Mishnah, the, from our Mishnah, the Ein Bain Mishnah, right? How are you going to, how are you going to derive from the Ein Bain Mishnah that the Chachamim disagreed with Rabbi Hanani ben Gamliel and they did not agree that when somebody is flogged that he no longer is Chayim Kares. He said, because it says in the Mishnah, Ein Bein Yeh Makipur Shabbos, that there's no difference between Shabbos and Yim Kippur. Elishazer, they they may be the Odom. It's only that this one who deliberately desecrated the, the Shabbos. So he is punishment, punished by the Bezdin, by human authority. And this one who deliberately violated uh, prohibition against in Yom Kippur, so he is going to be punished punished by Kares, by heaven. Now, in Isa, if you're going to say that what that receiving the lashes by uh, by a bezdin will then negate the Kares, then if that's the case, the Ein Bain is no longer true. Why? Because Idi the Idi in both cases. Yom Kippur and Shabbos, Midday Adamu. It's ultimately something that is punishable by human authority. Why? Because even in the case of Yom Kippur, you can, uh, you can give him a punishment down here by humans, and that way negate the Kores. And so therefore, the fact that our Mishnah uh, maintains that Ein Bein, that there's no difference between, between um, Shabbos and Yom Kippur, other than the fact that they are different. This one is punishable by death, uh, uh, by by earth, and this one is punishable by 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 Karis, by Shemayim. They hold that they disagree with uh, Reb Hanani ben Gamliel that the uh, the flogging does not cancel it out. Okay. Now, before I go any further, right? Before I go any further, I want to share something very interesting with you. About five hundred years ago, there was a very big discussion in Eretz Yisrael, with regards to reinstituting the Sanhedrin by giving Semicha again. Why? Because the Chachamim, the rabbis over there that were living in Tzfas, they felt because there were a lot of people who had fled from Spain and the people who were fleeing from Spain, right? In 1492, they were all expelled from Spain because they had been converted to Christianity. And these are such a various that you're high of courage for, right? Even if you didn't mean it, nevertheless, these things are, are, are terrible averis. And so they wanted to give people an opportunity to what? To be able to receive Malchus. But the problem is you cannot, you cannot give Malchus um, if you're not a Sanhedrin, if you're not, if you don't have smicha, if you don't have smicha, then you can't give, uh, you can't give Malchus. So they wanted to reinstitute this whole thing of Malchus. So let me just quote something for you over here. One second, let me just share this with you. Um, over here. So look, he, you see, this is in the Rambam, uh, in the in the laws of, in the laws of Sanhedrin, right? Chapter seventeen, halacha seven. It says, "Call me shechata." The locker, anybody who sinned and he was lashed, so he goes back to his 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 kosher state, his original state of acceptability. Shenema, like it says, as we quoted of him, right, that your brother will be uh, embarrassed in front of you before you rise. Kim once he's once since he's been flogged, is your brother, and so he says, so too, all. Those obligated for kares shelaku that were uh, flogged nifteru midei kirisasan. They are um, they are um, absolved for kares. So now, 
For this reason, they wanted to try and go back and make smicha. And there was a big heated debate between the rabbis of Sfas and the rabbis of Yerushalayim. So you had um, you had Mari Berav, uh, which was Rabbi Yake Berav, um, who wrote a whole kuntras of smicha. And he, uh, I think a lot was based on a lot was based on the, the following Rambam. If you look in the Rambam, which I have over here, I just pulled it up. It's Mishnah Torah, the laws of Sanhedrin. So he writes over here, What happened in Israel is that you would have one guy giving the smicha, and he would put two people next to him, and then he would be able to confer smicha for to 70 people at a time, is right. Let's keep going. Yeah. So he says over here, if you go to near near Lihad Dvorim, near in Lihad Dvorim, seems to me the scheme will call Akhamim if all Shabarit Yisrael, if all the rabbis living in Eretz Yisrael would agree, Laman is Dayonim to appoint Dayonim, the Lismech Aisam, and they would agree to give them smicha, Hare El Smuchim. So then they become ordained. They are then able to, um, they are able to judge uh, the matters where you have penalties included. And then they are able to then confer the smicha on the others. If so, so then why were they, why were the rabbis uh, pained over the smicha? So that you shouldn't, um, ultimately, end up losing the laws of penalties um, 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 among among the Jewish people. The fish is all because the Jewish people are all scattered. We can't have everybody agreeing. If you had somebody who was ordained by somebody who was ordained, so then in a tarik that's kulon. He doesn't need to have everybody uh, agreeing. And the don dinikinos is like he's able to um, judge with regards to. Penalties for everybody. Shari Nismach may be based on because he was already ordained by the best din. And ultimately, this uh, this 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 this, this uh, needs uh, a resolution. But it seems that the Beis Yosef, the Beis Yosef, paskened like uh, like this Rambam, relying on this Rambam, saying that you can ultimately uh, confer smicha. And what happened was it was a massive. Fight between um, this this uh, this guy. His name was uh, the, the Mari, and then the the Ralbach. Um, so Reb Levi Bar Chaviv. So he was very he, he was very opposed to this. He was very afraid that that what they're going to do is they're going to start ch- uh, they're going to start changing the calendar. And they, they were, he was just very worried about what they were doing, and he felt it was very dangerous. And you know, so what happened was, um, a, quite a number of rabbis. Um, agreed with uh, Marie Berav, and he was the first one to receive this smicha, and then he in turn uh, gave offered the smicha. His he offered smicha to the Maharbach. He tried to you know to offer smicha to the his uh, his opposition in Yerushalayim, to which the uh, the Ra'abach turned around and said that he had no right to 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 do it to begin with, and ultimately what happened was. The, the, the rulers of the Ottoman Empire got wind of it, and they felt that uh, these people were uh, perhaps trying to plot a taking over of Eretz Yisrael and reestablishing Eretz Yisrael as a Jewish state. And so therefore the, Ma, the, the Mari Beirav had to run away to Egypt. Um, but uh, he, as I said, he, he, he uh, gave smicha to the Beis Yosef, and the Beis Yosef uh, gave to others, and uh, Reb Chaim Vital was ultimately was also uh, uh, received the smicha from 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 this whole incident. Um, but but what we see what we see from here is <clears throat> bringing it back to our Gemara that this idea of somebody receiving makis and as a result of these floggings can then go back and not be chayv cars or something that was taken seriously by the by the chachamim. And they wanted to be able to use this, especially for those people who unfortunately had been uh, put under duress and were forced to convert to Christianity in, in the time of, of, of the Spanish 
uh, Inquisition. Anyway, be that as it may, let us move on. Any questions or any comments? Anybody want to share anything about this? Going once, going twice, sold. All right. So, Amr Ibn Nachman. So, Ibn Nachman. Well, um, yeah. I just had a thought, you know, because if it didn't cancel out the karet, that means yeah. you would have been punished twice. And right. for the same thing. And, so and there, I think that was the reason. There are some there are some commentaries that say that in fact we're not understanding the Rambam correctly. The Rambam was he said this is what he says. He says that we, what we're talking about is in a case where a person violated the Shabbos, and in that case, the only way you're going to get skila is. The only way you get skila is if you're warned and you're brought to the Besdin, right? However, right. what if there are no witnesses? So now you're Chayef Kares. It's true you're not Chayef Skila, but you're Chayef Kares, right? So in other words, there's certain times where if you are Chayef Misa from the Besdin, but there's no witnesses there, so you cannot be put to death, don't worry. Hashem holds the score and you're Chayef Kares, right? And Hashem will already take care of you. So, so the way the, the Mepharshim understand, some Mepharshim understand, the Rambam is that he's saying that when you're Chayiv Kores, because there's no witnesses, only in those instances, um, only in those instances, like in Michal Shabbos, um, uh, do, does flogging uh, negate the Kores. But where something is, in the first instance, Kores altogether, then, then, then it wouldn't work. Anyway. Okay. So, yeah. So the, the bottom line, let's 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 just go over the flow of the Gemara. The flow of the Gemara is that we want to say that our Mishnah serves as a proof for Rabbi Yechanan, that when Rabbi Yechanan says that the rabbis disagree with Rabbi Hanani ben Gamliel, when he says that once somebody is being flogged, he is uh, he's considered to be like your brother and therefore he doesn't get Kares. He says he brings our Mishnah to show that the rabbis disagree with him because if they agreed with him, then when we say ain bain yemakipurim uh, it would it wouldn't be true. Why? Because even that isn't the difference. Because both of them are punishable by earth. Because we said that you could get mount makis for yom kippur. So Amr Rav Nachman, Rav Nachman wants to reject this proof that Rava brought. Right? That he wants to reject this because why? How many? Whose opinion is this Mishnah? Rabbi Yitzchak, it's Rabbi Yitzchak. The Amma that he said, Malkas v'chayve krisis leka. He, when it says, ain't vain, it's not the Chachamim, right? Who do, would disagree with Rabbi Hanani ben Gamliel. But rather, it's Rabbi Yitzchak. And Rabbi Yitzchak is the one who holds that when, that that Malkus by Chayve Karisis does not exist. There are no lashes for people <coughs> who are Chayve Karis. The Tanya has been told in the Brisa. Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak says, Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak says, Chayve Karisis Bichlal Okay, so in Parshas Achrebis, right, it talks about all the forbidden unions that you get Karis for, right? It says that all of these forbidden unions that bear Karis were included in the Torah's general statement that says um, anybody who commits any of these abominations will incur kores. So then why in Pasha's Kedoshim does it come back and it say again, in Pasha's Kedoshim, it comes and it mentions the case of somebody who has relations with his sister that she's going to be uh, receiving kores, so says Rabbi Yisak, the reason why the Torah comes and says it again is to teach me an important lesson. What's the lesson? Laduna bekores v'leib malkus to teach us that you're only she's, you're only going to be liable for kores and not with lashes. And then, by extension, we're going to say that that applies by to all the other chayve krisus that they also only receive um, kores and they don't receive. Um, lashes. So we know every day before davening, there we read third, 13 principles, right? That Rabbi, uh, that Rabbi Shmuel taught, right? That these are the principles how we learn things from the Torah. 
Okay. One of the principles is that something that was in part of a cloud, right? And then it leaves the cloud. It doesn't leave the cloud. It doesn't leave the general rule just to teach about itself, but it comes to teach about everything else that's in the cloud. So in this case, the, the scenario of somebody having relations with the sister was included in all the prohibited unions in Pashas Acharemos. Then it becomes separated and taught alone in Pashas Kedoshim. So whatever it teaches me with regards to that particular case of somebody having relations with the sister, it teaches me the same principle for all the others that were included in the general rule in Pasha's Acharemus. And from here we learn, and this is what Rabbi Sok is teaching us, that what? That <clears throat> when it comes to anything that you're liable to receive curries for, you do not receive lashes for. <laughs> so therefore, Rabbi, yes. When they, but when they say, Yatsa karet ba'achoto ledona bekaret, Ledona means she gets karet? To well, ledona means to judge it, to judge it, that, that specific... Or the situation, not, yeah. not the sister, but the situation. The situation, yeah. Okay. And they're both high karets, yeah. But bottom line, bottom line is um, we're saying, right, that if you could receive lashes for curry sins, then the sinner would be absolved from uh, uh, would be absolved from curry by receiving lashes. As Reb Hananiah uh, ben Gamliel holds. So says the Gemara. There's another way to reconcile our Mishnah with the opinion of Reb Hananiah ben Gamliel. Reb Ashi Omar, Reb Ashi says, You could even say that uh, that this Mishnah is actually follows the a view of the Rabbana. Right? And what does it, in other words, if we want to basically say that the rabbis agree with Hanani bin Gamliel and say that when you when you give, when you administer lashes, it does absolve him from Kares, then how does it fit with our Mishnah? It still fits with our Mishnah because what we're saying are not in absolute terms, but in general terms. When we say that there's no difference between Shabbos and Yom Kippur, other than this one is judged with uh, by a Bezdin, and this one is Karis, that's in general, meaning that this is the main punishment for the uh, for deliberate desecration of Shabbos is by the Bezdin. Right? Obviously, if somebody violates the Shabbos, right, and there are no witnesses, then you're going to have an instance, we're going to have an instance of Kharis, right? Where you're going to be killed, uh, cut off from Shammai, right? But we're saying in general, right? Generally speaking, when we speak about the desecration of Shabbos, it's human authority that's going to um, that's going to punish. And when it comes to Yom Kippur, that the main punishment for the deliberate desecration is Karis. But yes, if you find a scenario where people had warned him and as a result of the warning, he was brought to Bezdin and then he was given, then he was given lashes, then that might be a case where um, where you where the human the human Bezdin would uh, would met out the punishment. But generally speaking, um this would be the difference that this is this one is Bidei Adam and this one is Bidei Shemaim. At this point, we go over to Daf Ches Ahmed Aleph. If anybody has any questions on anything that we've learned so far, please ask now. Anybody? It's 34. All right. Says the Mishnah. We're now going to enter into a discussion. Um, with regards to the laws of promises and donations, okay? Now, remember, we're really talking about Megillah. We're talking about Purim. We're talking about other. How did we get here? 
The way we got here was because we started with Ain Bain. There's no difference between the, the first Adar and the second Adar, right? And once uh -huh. you started with Ain Bain, the Mishnah um, and the Gemara went on to other things where we say Ain Bain. And so as we're going through the Ain Bains, we're covering a lot of different issues and different topics from all over Torah. So in this one, it says as follows: Ain bein hamudar hano mechaveroi lemudar mimenu machal. There's no difference between someone prohibited by a vow to benefit from another and someone prohibited by a vow to derive food-related benefit from him. Which means as follows: A person is able to make a vow and say, "I am not going to derive any benefit from so and so." Or they could say a more limiting uh, vow. I'm not going to benefit from any type of food from food-related item from this person. What's the difference between the two? So this is what the mission is coming to say. The mission is coming to say, first of all, you have to understand that the issue of the Dorin is a very, very a uh, serious and severe issue, which is why you'll find Jews everywhere saying, Blineder, right? Everything is without a promise. And when it comes to before Rosh Hashanah, we do Hataras Nidarim, which we is uh, releasing ourselves from vows. And on Yom Kippur, we have Kol Nidre, where we release ourselves from vows. Because it's a very, very serious thing to say something and not keep it. If you take upon yourself something and you don't keep it, it's, it's a terrible thing. So here we're saying somebody had um, the, taken upon themselves not to have benefit from somebody else. Now, what's the reason why he made this vow? It could be for anything. It could be because he's trying to go on a diet. He knows that every time he goes to this guy's house, he eats too much or whatever it might be. But he makes it so that, that it should be very serious for him and that should not have any benefit. So there's two ways to do it. One is to say, I'm not going to have any benefit from this person, in which case that makes everything that belongs to this person off limits for uh, for the guy taking the vow. Or he says, I'm not going to have any benefit from uh, from anything, I, I'm not going to have any food related benefit from him. Now, one thing I just want to point out before we go any further, right, is as follows the way we understand the extent that this can go, how far this spreads, is that I'm not allowed to get any monetary benefit from this person now if I took upon myself not to have any food related benefit from him. Why? Because the, 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 the logic is like this. If I come along and use something that would have cost me money to rent from somebody else, right? So then you saved me money. And with that money, I can buy myself food. And that's like a very, it's a bit of a stretch, but that's what we're saying. We're saying that, um, that, that I'm taking upon myself not to have any food related benefit from this person and this will extend to a lot of things. So now, so but what's the difference between somebody who takes upon himself a vow not to have any hana and somebody who takes upon himself a vow not to have any food-related um, benefit? So he says there's no difference between the two besides for the following. Eladrisas Haregel, except for setting foot on his property, there is a principle, right, that most people have no issue with people um, going onto their property um doesn't mean to stay there and to squat over there but it means um it means that you know to somebody to walk through if, he, if a person has um a field uh somewhere out in in in, in the open and people want to walk across the field obviously not while things are growing there but uh, during the other times of the year then uh, yeshua made a, a, a made a law that people should be allowed to cross each other's um property um if it's not going to cause any damage to the other person so therefore we're saying that if i say i don't want any benefit from you right then i would not be allowed to even step foot on your property because i have some kind of hana, whereas if I say I don't want to have any food benefit, right, then um, I would be able to cross and step on your on, on your property. And what's the other one? And using utensils with which people do not prepare food. And here again, it's going to have to be 
um, a kind of vessel that people don't usually uh, rent out, right? Because if uh, I were going to be rent, uh, borrowing it from you and thereby saving some money, I could use that money to buy food, right? Rabbi? Yes. What about here in the United States? Where crossing into someone's property is trespassing. So, Dina de Bakusa Dina, then you're not, then you're, you're not allowed. But uh, we're saying, um, the, the, the question that we have over here is, to what degree have you prohibited benefit from this person? Would there be anything that you could, on the one hand, benefit, and it wouldn't be covered in the vow that you have taken? Right? So, what we're saying is that if you've said, I'm not allowed to have any benefit, right? Then walking across somebody's field, even it, though it may not be a monetary gain that you get, but nevertheless, there's some benefit and therefore it's prohibited. But if it were taught, if, it, if you've just taken upon yourself a vow not to have food related benefit from this person and obviously you're not saving any money by stepping onto his property because he doesn't charge anybody to walk across his property and you're not therefore not having any monetary gain then you would be allowed in here in the united states where it's prohibited then this wouldn't even be part of the discussion we're talking about in a case where it's completely uh, permissible so i wanted i wanted to ask rabbi why do they keep saying Ochel Nefesh? Uh, well, Ochel Nefesh, um, it's, it's, it's a, I'm not sure why that is. expression. It, it, yeah, it's just, it's just a general expression. Like when we, when we talk about cooking and yamtiv, we call it Ochel Nefesh, the food for the soul. Like, you know, just, it's just food that we, that we eat. But uh, I don't think, I'm not sure what the specific uh, use of that term is. Well, in the slang, they have not ochel nefesh, but nefesh ochel in, in, in English. Uh -huh. Okay. 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 All right. So I'm sorry, uh, um, um, Ezra, I think you were trying to say something else. Well, well back to this question that I had before. Yeah. Uh, things like, for example, um, base Menachem or any of the shuls that are around, okay. Uh, are we saying that based upon what was being said over here, one can cross through, for example, the parking lot um, behind Sharit Fila, and that would be okay without without them saying it is okay or not okay. Because it is a Jewish organization, in, yeah. in, or well, for example, or the same, for example, the kollel as well. You know, parking from once going through one side of the parking lot through the other side of the parking lot by the corner, you know, so that whatever the reason is. Well, so uh, as I said before, Dina the Machusa Dina here outside <clears throat> of Eretz Yisrael, then we, we go according to the, the laws of the land. Um, but there is a principle that if it's that uh, if one person gains and the other person doesn't lose, then for somebody to um, make a deal out of it and not allow somebody to derive benefit if it doesn't cost them anything, that's not a Jewish way of that's not a Jewish way of practice. Now, if there are security concerns and other concerns, then obviously those concerns need to be taken taken into consideration. But we're talking about when all things are equal. Um, the way Jewish people should behave is that if somebody is able to get benefit, that's not going to, um, in, I'm not going to incur any costs, then obviously I'll be happy for them to uh, gain that benefit. And crossing through um, one of my fields in a valley um, where, it, you know, it's not bothering anybody. So then what would be the problem? You know, it, it, it's not, see, here's the thing. Remember, <clears throat> we have privacy issues, right? Somebody walking into my property where I'm living, right, and you know, thereby disturbing my peace and looking into my window—that's already damaging me. And we're not talking about 
in we're not talking about those those instances right um one second uh <clears throat> i'm starting to think of them. Um, I'm trying to find. I'm, I'm trying to find where 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 it said one second. Can't find it right now, but 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 it's it, it's. Where did it say it? Says it, I can't remember where I saw it, but I, I did see it uh, saying that 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 it was talking about specifically in a place where there's where 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 you have fields in in, in a valley, and it's not talking about necessarily in your house. Maybe it was Tasis. <clears throat> One second. Yeah, so if you look in Tasis on the Tasis Dris Saregal, right? So he says, don't we say in Cheskas Abatim? This is in Baba Basra. That uh, there's certain things that people 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 don't people don't 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 want, and you know people don't want people coming onto their onto their onto their field onto their onto their property. So he says, um, "One second. Oh, at the at the bottom at the bottom of the tesis, the tirits." Uh, Rabbeinu Tam, Rabbeinu Tam as the Hachi Mari here is talking about Mabika, is talking about a valley. The Lakotibo, uh, Shum Adam, nobody, nobody, um, nobody is, it, it takes, uh, you know, is, is particular about it and, and gets upset if somebody walks, um, you know, in a valley in, in, one, in one of his, uh, you know, fields over there, um, that people don't, don't, uh, don't take exception to it. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a place where you're not going to take exception uh, to people walking through. If that's the case, then this person is going to be no different than anybody else who has a free pathway through it for which he, no one else pays. So he, you wouldn't have to pay. So you'd, get, you'd, be, you'd be gaining no monetary benefit. So we still say, if you took upon yourself not to have any benefit from him you're not allowed to use that as as a pathway you're not allowed to go on to his, his property at all but if you just took upon yourself not to have any food related benefit from him then you then you would be allowed to uh, step onto his property okay <clears throat> says the Gemara right we said that what the only difference between uh, these two these two forms of vows right is whether you're allowed to pass through the property and to use your non-food related utensils so the gemara says so the one well, what we're saying is with regards to utensils with which people prepare food then both cases right are going to be identically uh, uh, identically prohibited <clears throat> okay the reasons are with regards to setting foot on the property's owner, says the Gemara, all the coffee in it, but people do not care. People do not uh, care if others pass through their property. So therefore, um, why would any? Why would anybody? If I'm coming along and I'm saying that people don't mind if I walk through the through the property. Right, if that's the case, so then why would I come along and apply this even to the case where somebody, um, where somebody makes a vow not to have any benefit from him? So, so the Gemara says, "Amar Rava, Rava answers, how money? Who's the Tana of the Mishnah? The Tana of the Mishnah is Rebeliezer. The opinion of Rebeliezer, the Amma Vitur Osur Bemudar Hana. <clears throat> Rebeliezer is of the view that even things that." people usually forgive and they don't mind, right? Those things are forbidden uh, for one that is prohibited by, um, by a vow from benefit, which means as follows. Let's say, right, I walk into a store and in this store, right, I have to pay for uh, goods. Now I say, I'm not going to have any benefit from this store. What do I mean by not having any benefits? Which means to say, of course, I'm going to pay for the things that I use, but I'm not going to get any free benefit from this place, right? 
nothing that's for free that I would have otherwise had to pay for, am I going to take from this store? Okay. Now, coming to the store, and the store owner is a very honest guy. And when you ask for a pound of meat or a pound of fish, whatever it is, so he usually adds a little bit more on top so that nobody comes to get later to complain that, ah, you, 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 you tricked me, you took, you took, <coughs> you overcharged me. He always gives a little bit on top for free to everybody. So now, Rebelez is of the opinion that when you say, I'm not going to have any enough from this store, right? Even if it is something which the store owner does for everybody, that nobody has to ever pay for the little extra that he adds on top, you, the one who took a vow upon himself not to have any benefit, would be prohibited from having any benefit. So if we take that principle and we apply it to this Mishnah, then we're saying, although it's true the owner doesn't mind people walking through his property, right? Nevertheless, since you took upon yourself not to have any um, any benefit from, from this person, th therefore, even though the owner doesn't mind when people walk through, for you, it'd be prohibited because you took that upon yourself. Yeah? Make sense? Uh, Rabbi? Yes? If you take a vow not to benefit from, from that person, mm -hmm. if you cross his field or his parking or whatever, his valley, whatever it is, yeah. There must be a reason you want to go through there. Maybe correct. you're saving yourself time. Maybe you're saving yourself energy. That's correct. So you still, that's a benefit. It doesn't matter that it's not monetary, but it's well, still a benefit. So that's what we're saying. That's what we're ultimately saying. We're ultimately saying that that's why you're not allowed to take upon yourself. You're not, you're not allowed to, uh, you're not allowed to have any benefit. I think, I think. Drisat the regel, that's what Drisat regel means. You know, you cannot do that. Right. But I think what the Gemara, the Gemara is trying to point out is that, generally speaking, when I take upon myself a vow, right, um, not to have a benefit, it's usually associated with monetary gain. Monetary gain from... If you said, I'm not going to have any monetary gain, that's different. Right. So when we say, when we say, Hana, it's a bit ambiguous. Hana means benefit. Are you talking yeah. about monetary benefit or are you talking about any benefit? So any we go benefit. To, so it seems that our Mishnah goes in accordance with Rebbe Liesa, who says that even the things that are usually, um, uh, you know, considered to be gratuities that are given by the owner, it's forbidden for somebody who said, I have taken a vow upon myself not to have any benefit from this person. Okay? All right. The next Mishnah says as follows. This is already, and we're moving from one thing to another thing. This is with regards to the base Hamikdash, that a person can come along and he can make a vow to bring a particular uh, carbon, or he can make a pledge, right? He can make, he can make a pledge, which is a, a, a gift offering. What's the difference between <coughs> a nader and a nadava? We'll see in a minute. <clears throat> There's no difference between the Nadarim, a vow offering, and the gift offering. Except that in the case of a vow offering, one is responsible for their security. Whereas the case of a gift offering, one is not responsible for their security. What does this mean? Well, this means as follows. If I come along and I would say that I want to give um, a animal to the base Hamikdash, that's what I said, then it doesn't matter whether um, I, uh, I lose the animal that I have in my possession, I'm always going to be responsible to give the worth of that animal to the base amigdosh or the, or an animal of that kind. So I, if somebody says, somebody says, I'm going to give a cow to the base amigdosh, right? That's what he says. I'm going to give a cow as an offering, right? As a, as an oil, I'm going to give an, uh, uh, you know, an, an offering, right? So that nether, you're always going to be obligated to give that cow. Why? Because once you said, I'm giving a cow, 
It's as if you've designated the money of the cow, and that's always going to be your responsibility to pay. However, an adava is when somebody comes along and says, this cow that I have, right, this cow that I have, I'm going to give to the Beis Amigdash. So now, if that cow has something happened to it, it stolen or lost, whatever it might be, so I'm no longer obligated to bring that, uh, to bring a carbon because I didn't set aside um, the money worth, but rather the animal itself. If the animal gets lost, I'm no longer obligated to bring up another one. So we're saying the only difference between these two things, between a neder, which is a vow, and an adava, when a person with, with, with a neder, the person says, Hare Allah, I take upon myself, uh, you know, uh, whatever you take upon yourself, or Hare Zu is an adava. This is, that's already a pledge when you're pledging this specific thing. Okay, so that's what the Mishnah says. Says the Gemara. The implication is, in regards to the prohibition of do not delay, when it comes to a person who has made either a vow or a, uh, when it comes to a vow, um, well, let's start with a vow first, right? When a person makes a vow, we're told that he has the three festivals to bring it up. If you postpone it after three festivals, then you have violated the prohibition of uh, not being, not delaying, bringing the pledge that you've made, making the vow that you've made. So we're saying that not only does that apply to a, apply to a vow, but it also applies to a pledge. Okay. So the Gemara now brings um, a Mishnah that defines and distinguishes between a vow offering and a gift offering. So now yeah, also, I, yes. I just want to understand this. A Nadava is like more like a one-time uh, contribution while a nether is something where you're making a vow and that should be consistent, you're saying. It, Am I that let, correct? No, let's let's, let's look at yourself. Oh, look in Rashi. Look in Rashi. There's only one Rashi in the Mishnah, so let's do it. It says in, the, it says in, it says in Rashi, right? Nether unadava. It says Rashi, Mephaish in the Gemara, it's explained in the Gemara. Nether, a vow, that is someone who says, I'm taking upon myself to bring an oila. And then after some time, it separated itself. In other words, it gets lost or whatever it might be. You are then obligated for uh, the security of this thing and you have to bring it up from your own money. You have to purchase another one. The dava, when it comes to a pledge, that's the one who says, that this is what I'm going to be giving, but like Kibla, a love, and he did not accept upon himself the achrayas of what happens if this gets stolen or lost. So therefore, if he manages to take it and bring it to the base of English, fine. If he doesn't, he's not obligated to bring another one in its I stead. See. I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, right. Um... And that Hossam, we learned over there in the Mishnah, says, Ezehu neder, what is the vow offering? Ha'oimeh, someone who says, Harei olai oile. Someone says that this is uh, going to be, I, I'm, I'm, I'm obligating myself to bring an oila offering. Now, this is a Mishnah in Kinnim. So, yeah. So, Kinnim talks about uh, about chickens, right? Ezehu uh, dava. So, which one, what is the meaning of a gift offering? Um, if anybody says that this animal is designated as an oil offering, now the reason why I mentioned that this is from a Sechus Kinim and it's talking about chickens is because I want you to understand that when it says somebody who takes upon himself that this is going to be an oil, the same would be true if he took upon himself for something to be a shlamim, right? It's not only an oil. But there's no such thing as a shlamim when it comes to chickens. So that's why it said an oil offering in that particular Mishnah that we're quoting from, from Masechus Kinim. So, but it, it, would, it would be true with any kind of carbon he took upon himself. If he says, hare olai, that's the idea of a nether. If he says, hare zu, that this is, that meaning pointing to a specific thing and pledging that particular thing, 
then that's considered to be an adava. So now, in this mission that we're quoting in Kinim, it says, What's the difference between vow offerings and gift offerings? So he says like this, when it comes to vows, mesu, if they died, or they were stolen, or they were lost, the vower is now responsible for their security, and he has to replace them. The dovis, but when it comes to pledges, Mesa, if they died, the nickname boy of do, or they were stolen or lost, and Chai Bakriusan is not responsible for their security. How do we know this? How do we know in the Torah that you're that 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 um you that you're obligated only for and then not for the Dava? In other words, how do we know that um that? The person who makes a, a nether, right, has a liability for the offering, but not for the gift offering. So says the Gemara to Tan Rabban, the Rabbi told in the Brisa, there's a posuk that says as follows: It says it shall be accepted for him to atone for him. What does this mean? It means as follows: Shimon Oimer, Shimon says, "Es sha'alav." It's for the one for that which is upon him. I.e., he said, Hare a lie, right? So then, Chayim Bachriusoi, he's Chayim for its Achrayas in order to be able to then receive his Kapara, right? In other words, if I come along and I said that this is going to be upon me, a vow to bring this, then it's only when I bring it up, meaning I actually fulfill the obligation. And bring it up. That's when I'm going to. That's when I'm going to uh, receive this atonement. I'm going to be. It's going to be acceptable. The esh ene olav. But anywhere where it's not olav, which means to say, uh, we're learning this as a drasha to say that if I didn't say hare olai, but rather instead of saying hare olai, I said hare zu, then I'm not responsible for its security. Right? Look in. Uh, in Rashi, you look in Rashi, right? Es Sha'alov, Chaim Bakru say. So Hoki Darish Le Likra. This is how Rebitska, and this is how um who was it? Reb uh Rebit? Was it Rebitska? Mm, Reb Shimon, sorry, this is how Reb Shimon understands the Pasuk. He says when it says when it says Nidroi, uh that his uh his Vow will be acceptable, like is kaper only when it will atone by hand with them. Have a will it be acceptable? Which means to say, I will become kapara before the kapara, i.e., before you actually bring it up as a mm -hmm. sacrifice. Then like nirza, then it's not going to be acceptable. Which means that you have the responsibility um, to secure and make sure that you act, you ultimately bring it. Well, but is it carbon? Uh, which carbon do we say? The Amartya Lechad, did I say this? It's only Ba'isa, in that one, Sha'alav, that you have this idea of Olav, Bahainu Olav Dikra, and that's what the Olav of the Pasuk means to say, when I said Hare Olai, that is when I'm going to be responsible. Mm -hmm. But prior to, uh, but, but in a case where I said Hare Zu, not Hare Allah, then it's not going to apply. Frank Gemara, my mashma, in other words, how is it implied uh, that, uh, says Rashi, what is my mashma? The Allah, that the word Allah, Kabbalah Sakhrayas Allah, is accepting upon yourself the security of this. So Omar of Dimi, Omar of Yitzchak Bar of Dimi, Rav Yitzchak Bar of Dimi says, Kevin the Omar, Allah, as one, as soon as one says, upon me, command the toin akatve domi, it's as if that he has said that he's, that the burden of responsibility rests upon my shoulders, meaning he's accepting personal liability to make sure to bring up the offering. So that's the end of this shtikl. Any questions? Akatve domi, does it mean money? Damai? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the money is my responsibility. Right. In other words, the worth. The worth the of what I... Of that, so yeah, then the I, I'll have that. to... Right. So therefore, I'm going to have to use my money to buy another one and to bring it up. A replacement, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. 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 Thank you, Rabbi.
That's if you say if you're holding a chicken, if you're holding a chicken, and you yeah. say, "I hereby bring this chicken as an oila," you don't bring the chicken as an oila. You have to sell the chicken and then use the money towards an oila. No, no. If I say hare a lie, hare not a lie, not a lie. I'm bringing this chicken. This chicken should be an ola. Then that's an adava. But no chickens are brought on the mizbeach. No, I understand. So what do you do with it? If you say this chicken should be an ola, you made an adava of an ola. Right. Of this chicken, you made an adava. But you right. can't bring a chicken as an oila. So I believe you then have to sell the chicken. Right. And its value goes to the oila. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Correct? Uh, I, I'm, I don't I'm, know. If you I, say I have to bring an oila, then you got to bring an oila. Finish and bring an oila. Right. If you... Given the dava of something that is not appropriate for its final use, you the object itself, I believe, still takes on the kedusha, and you're then forced to sell it right. and use the money towards the, the dava. That's correct. All right, that's all, Rabbi. Yeah. The- the the last word that you read, dummy. Yeah. That doesn't mean money. It means same. The yeah. same. It's equivalent. Correct. So correct. It has correct. nothing correct. to do with correct. money, right? Right. right. You're right. Yes, you're correct. Okay. The right. toilet say dummy is compared to, it's considered, considered. The dummy. value. Yes. The value. Okay. Uh, no, no, no. 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 Ben, 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 no. no. It dummy means considered. It's similar. In other words, it's as if. It's as if you have said that you've accepted it on your on on your shoulders. Shoulders, okay, right? It's a, it's it's different. It's different than, oh, than okay. Yeah. All right, Chavra. I wish you all a wonderful day. Thank, thank you. you. Right, a thank you, Rabbi. Good week and a good Rabbi. Chodesh. Chodesh tov. Chodesh tov.